We're going to try and finish our study of Acts today, and starting in chapter 16 is where Paul meets Timothy, who was a Jewish believer with a Jewish mother and a Greek father. And because of the father, Paul decided to have Timothy circumcised, not to obey the laws of Moses, but to minimize resistance in his coming travels among the Jews. This is still a transitional period, and he was just following the wishes of the Jerusalem Council to avoid needlessly provoking the Jews. So we can't presume his reasons for doing this, but we can say from all his teachings what they were not. Notice that in verse 10 that Luke uses the pronoun we from this point on most of the time, and that means he's traveling with them and reporting as an eyewitness. So it isn't anymore they, it's we. Then, you know, sometimes he'll say they, sometimes we, but whenever he says we, pay attention to that, and you'll see that that's when he's uh, joining up with the entourage. And so they traveled around and they came to this uh, Roman colony of Philippi and they went looking for a prayer meeting and they found a group of women there by the water because they, you know, this was part of the rituals and they didn't hesitate to join this group of women and speak to them. And one of them named Lydia was a prominent businesswoman. People thought that was impossible. And of course, there's no indication that she stopped being a businesswoman when she got saved. And she was receptive to the gospel, and it says she and her household were saved. <clears throat> then this phrase, and the one following where she invites them into her, rather than her husband's home, clearly portray Lydia as the head of her household. Remember also the Philippian jailer um, that was told that he and his household would be saved, and I think, well, I don't remember, it's been a while since I did the last lesson, whether we did that or we're going to do that, but um, similar situations where we see the phrase, she and her household, or he and his household. It doesn't mean God uh, saves everybody or not, depending on the head of household. It doesn't mean that at all. Now, some take the phrase in verse 14 as meaning that God forced her to receive the gospel. But the text doesn't say that God gave Lydia faith or controlled her mind, but that she, who was already devoted to God, she was there worshiping, should take to heart what God was saying. It was no different from what we would call confirmation from the Holy Spirit. And then down in, uh, let's go down to verse 16, we see that the next woman they encounter is quite the opposite. She is a slave girl with a spirit known as a python. And the python spirit was a fortune-telling spirit, also known as Delphi. You've heard probably of the Oracle of Delphi. It was connected with the worship of Apollo and fortune-telling. And after she pesters Paul and Silas for too long, Paul exercises the demon that had been giving her prophetic powers. But her handlers realize that this means the end of their lucrative business, so they make up a false charge against Paul and Silas, which results in a severe whipping and jail. And once again, there's a miraculous escape, but not a quiet one, as had been the case for Peter. And then we'll go down to verse 25. As they sit there singing in prison, there's a violent earthquake that opens all the prison doors. And yes, this is where we're going to meet the Philippian jailer. Um, so look for the same phrase about save, about the family being saved. And the, the simple reply when he asks how to be saved is for him to put his trust in Jesus. Some people stu stumble over the addition of and your household, but this hardly means that the family did not have to have faith, but were forced to believe whatever the head of household believed. The text states that the word of the Lord was spoken to all of them. So... Luke is just saying that everybody accepted it, not that everybody was forced to accept it. And then we'll go down to verse 35. <clears throat> and the next day, the officials of Philippi try to get Paul and Silas released quietly, but Paul would have none of it. He demands justice, which some believers today would think is wrong for a Christian. And he uses his Roman citizenship to his advantage, though no one doubts the evil of the Roman government. So being a Christian doesn't mean being stupid or presenting ourselves as punching bags to the world. Paul used his worldly credentials when he could. Now let's go to chapter 17. And we see that they're, they move on from Philippi. And the most notable incident in this section is the contrast between the people of Thessalonica and Berea. <coughs> Rather than reacting with emotion upon hearing new ideas, they turn to the scriptures to cross-examine what Paul was saying, which Luke cites as an example of noble character. This is an important lesson for us today. Not only must we restrain our reactions 
and know the scriptures, we must also not blindly swallow what we may hear from preachers and teachers. This is how discernment is practiced, and it supports the use of old books. Some people complain about the Bible as an old book. But these Bereans did the same thing, and they used them to determine spiritual truth. And once again, Luke mentions prominent women in this section. This is also where we meet the people of uh, Berea who listened to Paul and checked his teachings. And all Christians should practice this to make sure that what someone teaches is not in violation of Scripture. Feelings and impressions are unreliable, but the Word of God never changes. So we should all be able to do what the Bereans did here. And then we'll go down to verse 13. And after more hounding by the jealous Jews, Paul winds up in Athens, where he engages in public debate with the Jews and anyone else who happened by. Eventually, the Greeks invite him to speak at the Areopagus, which was the legal and financial city center. It's also known as Mars Hill. But this is a common public place where they had these public discussions. Now we'll go down to verse 22. <coughs> And Paul begins by taking note of the many shrines in the city of Athens, including one to the unknown God. So Paul sees this as a hook to introduce them to this God. He isn't trying to accept their beliefs at all, as some people claim, but he's using their own beliefs to lead them to Christ. In his speech, he says that God appointed the times and boundaries of the nations. Is this proof that God has to choose individuals for salvation? Not at all. It's about na nations and eras and bringing uh, groups of people to power or bringing them down. So, because uh, many people will take verses like this out of context and take them to mean that God has to choose individuals for salvation, but that's not the case at all. So Paul says in verse 30, let's go down to there, <coughs> that in times past, God overlooked people's worship of false gods in their ignorance. But now, what has changed? Jesus rose from the dead, People have to change their minds and accept the one God raised from the dead. This is a stark contrast from Peter's speech to the Jews on Pentecost who already worshipped the right God, but needed to accept Jesus as Messiah. And another woman is mentioned at the end of the chapter, Damaris. So the point is that what Peter said to the Jews who already believed in the one true God is not the same as what Peter or what Paul would say to the Gentiles. And it's not a message of condemnation. It's a message of now you can't wallow in your ignorance. Now you have to accept something is true. So that's our pattern for reaching the lost. Our pattern for reaching the, the Jews who are in fact lost since they don't have the son. They don't have the father as the um, Apostle John will explain. And it's a very great error for some people to say that Jews don't need to be saved. They do worship the one true God, but they have not accepted the Messiah and for that reason, they also don't accept the Father. So they need to be evangelized as well, but it's a little different approach. So then in chapter 18, Paul meets two more familiar names, Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla is the lady and Aquila is the man. It's presumably a married couple. They were all, three of them, with Paul in the tent making trade. I mean, they had just met Paul, but they were all tent makers. And so they formed this business partnership. And this is one example of Paul earning his own wages and it was not until others arrived that he was able to go back to proclaiming the gospel full time. He's run out of town as usual, but this results in the gospel being brought to Corinth. And it's at this point that Paul has become so exasperated that the Jews that he turns finally to the Gentiles. Now let's go down to verse 18. He goes off with Priscilla and Aquila to Syria, but it says that this happened after Paul had his head shaved because of a vow he had taken. This type of vow was usually out of gratitude rather than practicing the laws of Moses. It was not a sin offering. And while there is nothing in Christian living to demand the taking of vows, neither is there anything to forbid them. Paul does it right here. What matters, what Paul taught in practice, is that we don't make rules for other people. And notice once again that the, that public debate is not forbidden either. Both Paul and the familiar Apollos engaged in such debates. But notice as well that both Priscilla and Aquila teach Apollos the full gospel. He didn't have it all at that time. The woman is not in, excluded from this, and she's named first most of the time. So there's nothing to indicate that she needed her husband's permission or oversight or leadership. Now let's go to chapter 19. And in verse 13 is where we will see the incident of some Jews who decide to use the name of Jesus to drive out demons, like it's some kind of magic word. 
it doesn't go very well for them because as non-Christians, they don't have the Holy Spirit. So as with Ananias and Sapphira, remember them, people learn to respect the name of Jesus because of this. And in this case, many of the converts brought all the occult books they had formerly used and burned them in public, and it was a humongous amount of money that those books were worth. So, now Paul goes to Ephesus, and he draws the negative attention of an influential silversmith named Demetrius, who was head of a trade guild who made shrines for their goddess Diana, also called Artemis. And they stir up this mob, which then spends two hours chanting mindlessly to her, but an official finally gets them to calm down and uses the threat of the Roman uh, government, charging them with rioting to convince them to disband. And this is the angry mob of heathen that was, is called an ecclesia. I mentioned that in an earlier lesson. This is that incident where they gather together this great crowd, and that word crowd or mob or multitude is ecclesia. The exact same word used for church throughout the rest of the New Testament in most translations. It is the assembly or the congregation or whatever you want to call it, but church is hardly a descriptive word and it's a made up word from anti-biblical sources actually. Um, but it is the same word here as for the gathering of believers. This doesn't mean believers or that unbelievers are churches. It just means that um, this was a common word. It was not a special ecclesiastical word. So, just to make that point, now let's go on to chapter 20. And down, this is where we see another of, one of Paul's miracles where he raises a boy to life who had fallen out of a third story window after falling asleep listening to Paul. So let this be a lesson, lesson to both the long-winded and the disinterested. Okay, now down in verse uh, 17 is where we see that the that Paul meets with the elders of the local congregation or ecclesia in Ephesus and as noted before there were several of them not one head elder with associate elders as tradition has had it there is no hierarchy no chain of command no CEO with a board of directors this is just elders a group of people who had been walking the walk who were observed to live out the life and who could rightly divide the word of truth that's all it takes to be an elder, and then you have to agree to be seen as one, and being seen as one means that you are serving as a role model. And Paul will have more teachings about that sort of thing in his letters, but let's go down to verse 28 here. And he says in his advice to those elders that they are reminded that they are shepherds and guardians with serious responsibilities, and the danger they were to guard against was the eventual arising of wolves from among them who would ravage the flock. And this was bound to happen practically as soon as Paul turned his back, and history shows the tragic accuracy of that prediction. According to noted historian Philip Schaff in History of the Christian Church, section 42, Clergy and Laity, this process of transforming the congregation from organism to organization began in the second century AD. There were control-seeking people who formed a hierarchy and turned Jesus' command for the greatest to be the least on its head. They did exactly what Jesus said not to do and has been perpetuated ever since, and not just by the Catholic Church. The Protestant churches have done the same. They still have altars. I don't understand why in Protestant churches. They still have this head elder or pastor. They still have rituals. They still have pews watching the religious people do the religious stuff. And this isn't what Jesus had in mind at all. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we should read the New Testament to get our instructions on how to be the church, not from tradition. Now, down to, um, I think we're pretty much done with uh, chapter 20. So let's go on to chapter 21. And down in verse 8, uh, Paul has told of various travels, and then, uh, or Luke has told of various travels, and then the narrative comes to Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven so-called deacons, and I think that was Acts 6, and the one who encountered the Ethiopian official, this, this is that Peter, or I'm sorry, this is that Philip. His four unmarried daughters were prophets, a scandal to many modern Christians, <coughs> who believe that women are to stay in the kitchen and let men do all the spiritual activities. This is not biblical, it's traditional. And then this, there's this prophet named Agabus who had early, uh, earlier prophesied a famine in Judea. 
who now tells Paul that he can expect to be arrested and confined by the Jews in Jerusalem. But this is no deterrent to Paul, who, as you remember, was called to this kind of suffering. Now let's go down to verse 20. And Paul arrives there to see James and the other elders, but they want Paul to prove that he had not abandoned Jewish customs, since everyone knew he mingled with Gentiles. And Paul did not live under the laws of Moses, per 1 Corinthians 9.20, where he says, To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. So again, as a Jew, he was free to keep Jewish customs, but as a Christian, he was not free to keep the laws. But Gentiles could also observe Jewish customs, and it's any foreigner today might observe the customs of the land they're in to show acceptance. That's all Paul is doing. <coughs> and in contrast to this, many Christians today try to make observance of Jewish customs and the laws of Moses mandatory. And they aren't practicing them to win anyone over, but to push them away. We're supposed to be persuading people to become Christians, not Jews. Now let's go down to verse 26. Paul takes the elders' advice in appeasing the Jews, but the unbelieving Jews jump to wild conclusions about Paul having brought Gentiles into the temple compound on the presumption that being with Paul in the city is the same as being with Paul in the temple. It's this kind of incident which begins a long series of events that will eventually end with Paul being a prisoner in Rome. So this is where that started, all based on mistaken assumptions. We should be careful not to do that. The commander of the Roman legion stationed there comes to stop the riot, and he decides to take Paul into custody until he finds out why the people are trying to kill him. And again, this is the first step of many that would eventually end Paul's life. So now let's go down to verse 37. And they, were, they enter the citadel, and Paul asks for permission to speak to the mob, and he does so in Aramaic, which in some translation is called a Hebrew dialect, to show that he is a fellow Israelite. And then this continues in uh, chapter 22, so we'll go there. And he begins to speak, and in verse 3, um, he mentions his training under Gamaliel, who was the one who had wisely advised the Sanhedrin not to fight against God, regarding Peter. So it's that guy, that same Gamaliel. And he tells of his, Paul does, tells of his Damascus Road experience again. And now we go down, we'll skip through that to verse 21. And he comes to the part where Jesus tells him to go to the Gentiles. And of course, at this point, the, the mob has been triggered and they go into this insane murderous rage. So the commander takes him inside the citadel to have him flogged until he confesses to something. And again, as with the incident with the Philippian jailer, he uses his Roman citizenship to protect himself. So let's go down to verse, uh, we can see down here in verse 30, that the next day the commander releases Paul and orders the Sanhedrin to convene and put Paul on trial. So he's trying, the commander is trying to figure out what's going on here, but the Sanhedrin has other plans. So verse, or chapter 23 as soon as Paul begins his defense before the Sanhedrin, he is punched in the mouth at the order of the high priest, who Paul quickly threatens with God's wrath and calls him a whitewashed wall. It's only when he is told that this is the high priest that he apologizes, which means there was nothing about the priest to indicate someone who should have had better demeanor. The speaking evil is what Paul says should not be done to a ruler. He's not saying that rulers should never be held to account. He's just saying be respectful. But then Paul gets an ingenious idea. He splits the Sanhedrin so they won't reach a verdict. He wants a hung jury. And he knows that half of them are Pharisees and half are Sadducees. And his statement about being a Pharisee who believes in the resurrection of the dead is true. But his motive here is to get the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin to bicker with the Sadducees instead of all uniting against him since the Sadducees didn't believe the dead are raised. See, that's the thing, is he's saying a true statement, but they're taking it wrong, and he knows they are, and he's using that to his advantage. He's saying that he knows that they have a, a problem with um, the resurrection of the dead, and that he can split them down the middle on that point. So all he does is say, that's what I believe, and so he, the Pharisees are going to defend him, and that's how it turns out. So let's go down to verse 10. And this time it's the Jewish leaders fighting over Paul instead of the mob. And the commander has to take him back to the citadel again before they tear him apart. And while he's in his cell, 
Jesus comes to encourage Paul and tells him he'll wind up in Rome to give testimony. He doesn't tell him what else is going to happen in Rome, but he's going to go there to give testimony. But the Jews can't seem to keep themselves from using violence to solve problems, so they hatch this plot to ambush Paul by getting the commander to move him to another location. But Paul's nephew learns of the plot and goes to the citadel to tell him, and Paul sends him to the commander with this information. So let's go down to verse 20. And the commander makes sure Paul is moved safely to Governor Felix in Caesarea instead of the Sanhedrin. So that has been thwarted. And then we go down to verse 25, and here's the text of his letter that the commander sends. And this is what we would call padding the resume here. Since he paints himself as a defender of Roman citizens rather than the one who almost punished one illegally. So Paul right, arrives there and the governor has him wait for his accusers to get there too. So now let's go to chapter 24. And there we go. Finally flip the page. And this is uh, mostly the details of legal proceedings in Paul's case. So you can read through chapter 4. Um, you know, Paul is just setting up his case, and um, so we can really skip over that for commentary. And then, in chapter 25, he Paul makes an appeal to Caesar, <coughs> Excuse me, which was a formal appeal to the highest court. And this is how Paul will wind up in Rome, just as Jesus said he would. So he, Paul is you know, concerned that he's going to get sidetracked again. He wants justice. He has every right to ask for it as a Roman citizen and as a Christian. So he says, I appeal to Caesar. And they said, well, we would have let him go, but that isn't God's plan. And Paul knows if he's let go, this will just happen again anyway. So let's go to chapter 26. <coughs> Sorry about all the coughing. And um, in verse 7 is where Paul says that his people are composed of 12 tribes, not two, not 10, 12. 12 tribes, right there in Acts 26, 7. Okay, the 12 tribes of our people. <coughs> so, so much for the lost tribes theory. Now let's go to chapter 27. And... This is basically a chronicling of Paul's convoluted journey to Rome, including a shipwreck, more converts, and you can read all of that. It's just a uh, historical narrative. Excuse me. <coughs> and then we finally come to chapter 28, where Paul is put under house arrest in Rome for two years, though he's given a lot of freedom as he awaits trial before Caesar. And Luke ends his account with Paul still alive, but we know from other historical accounts that Paul would eventually be beheaded, which was considered an honorable and humane death for a Roman citizen. So um, this is pretty much where Luke decides that this is the end of the Acts of the Apostles, of, uh, as far as the task he was given by Theophilus, if you remember at the beginning. So God has ways of, of getting people to where they need to be. <coughs> and Jesus had said that uh, not only would Paul go to Rome, but in general, he had said that they, you know, the, his disciples, his followers would stand before rulers and kings and give testimony and be told what to say. And this is basically the story of Paul's life and a lot of the other apostles that, you know, Peter and, and the others had been in front of the Sanhedrin. And now Paul was going for going before the secular leaders as well to give testimony. So this is how the gospel spreads. It spreads by persecution and hardships. So we can't think that because such things happen to us that this is God abandoning us or anything like that. Paul could easily have made that claim, but he never did. It is helpful for Paul that Jesus appeared to him from time to time to encourage him, but at the same time we do have the Holy Spirit and should not have any more trouble trusting God than Paul did. So, um, and I'm pretty sure he had a lot more responsibility on him for laying foundations, as he will put it later in his letter to the Corinthians, his first one. And that is pretty much the end of our study of Acts.